Hello my soccer universe, match day 2 is in the books and now we don't have any early kickoffs anymore which is a shame because again the early kickoff delivered. This was probably the best slot to watch games, underappreciated teams but usually a whole lot of action and so I'm sad to see those go. On the other side I'm also quite happy that the schedule with the games eases up a little bit. It's not as much investment needed to follow all these games and you know I'm always pushing to watch them all. I know, I'm not, but that's why I'm making videos also about this stuff. But we had a historic day yesterday. Uh, first off, Georgia, a historic first point. Was it deserved? Well, I let you be the judge on that. Then Portugal qualify and win Group F. Is this really good for them? We had the mother of all own goals in there with a comical sequence of errors. Not only on the pitch, but also the cameraman. We had Ronaldo getting a record. Yes, we got a record for Ronaldo and some pitch invaders. And then we have Belgium bouncing back against Romania. And again, Lukaku scored. He would be the top scorer of this tournament. But VAR, he's the VAR top scorer of this tournament. But before we get started with all these games, Jersey matchup, bingo. I want to say I got everything right, but I didn't. I mean, I was so happy that I got the one for Georgia against the Czechs, right? Georgia did play in their red third jerseys. I kind of had a feeling because they were pushing this already so much in qualifying that I was quite happy to see that one. It's of course the one that I'm hanging here as well. And then Turkey is my bane in this. Now they played against Georgia at home in their red jerseys. Now they play against at home against Portugal. They choose their white jerseys. Just when I had them down that they play in their red jerseys and we will see the Portugal away kit which we'll still probably see against Georgia. They switch it all around. It, it just, there's no rhyme and reason with Turkey for me. So yeah, Turkey, you're my pain and that's what I got wrong. Of course, Belgium against Romania, that was a relatively easy one as well. But let's get started in Group F in Hamburg, the last early kickoff between Georgia and Czech Republic. And the Czechs went for it. They really went for it, very physically, especially midfield. I think all the midfielders got yellow cards, which I think is really remarkable. But they went all in, they created chances early on. I think it's Su Sufal created quite a few of those, Schick uh, misfiring, Lozhek misfiring. But you know, it, it seemed to work. Mamadashvili creating the most saves at the Euros so far. <laughs> the Czechs are not scoring. They actually did score, but the goal was ruled out because of Lozhek handball. But it would have been a deserved lead for the, for the Czechs. But then the goal came on, on the other side. I mean, it was the first chance for Georgia. And then in the build-up to this chance, you see, again, it was my friend Hranac, who already scored the own goal in, against Portugal. It was very instrumental in the other goal as well, who now touches the ball with the hand in the box. It's a penalty. Mikotatsu converts it and Georgia completely against the run of play take the lead into the half also because Schick right there after has a pretty big chance again and again Mamadash really saves. Early in the second half Georgia actually had a few counter attacks where I really felt you know there's a chance in there that they could make it a 2-0 and especially there was one run from Kvartskelia where they have suddenly a 3-2 against the Czech defense and they just couldn't play it out well and that was also a little bit of a story. The only shot on goal for Georgia was that one penalty. However, where the Czechs bring on Lingerer for Hlozek and Lingerer is almost immediately of impact, creating a corner kick and then on that corner he heads it towards goal, it lands on, on the post, goes on the chest of Patrick Schick and it is 1-1. Unfortunately for Patrick Schick, shortly after he had to come off because he had a calf injury and it does not look good. Also, you felt that both teams were going for it and it was then suddenly a wide open wild game. <laughs> both teams were also really tired. Especially the physicality of the Czechs really did not pay off for them. And so, yes, while the Czechs were then really pushing for, for the win, I mean, taking massive risks, putting four men in, in the box, launching long balls, leaving themselves open on the back. They didn't create that many chances anymore. In fact, the biggest chance to win it fell to Georgia when they had a three on one. I think it was a Lobjanice then, who runs onto goal, gets the ball, and puts it over the, over the bar 
that would have been the famous win. It's still the first point for Georgia ever at a European Championship. So that's a big one. And I really think that the Czechs are pulling together one of the most unlucky performances at these Euros. I think based on performance, they would have deserved to get at least a point against Portugal. And now they completely dominated Georgia, especially in the first half, creating an XG of 3.09. Three goals expected and they got only a solitary goal. It's really, really rough. But I think the Czechs, if they get a little bit of luck on their side, they should be a better side than Turkey. Speaking of Turkey, ahead of the match against Portugal, we knew it is again played in the Westfalenstadion, full with Turkish people. And of course, I think Turkey might have at least the second highest support in Germany themselves because you know there are so many Turkish people living in Germany especially in regions like the Ruhr, Berlin and, and so on so they will have massive support regardless. But the other thing that I knew is that while Turkey really is great going forward their defense always has me a little bit worried. They are rather open they were already against Georgia and that's why the game was so great and then add to it that the reserve goalkeeper had to come in and I thought oh this might not work out for them. The only thing that might be saving them is that Portugal did not look quite right in the first game however this time around Martinez got his lineup right Portugal looked relatively solid you know Bruno Fernandes, Leao, Ronaldo and Bernardo Silva up front it's almost unfair the amount of talent that Port Portugal have and yes they had to work themselves into the game the game was relatively even both sides creating some minimal chances but I also saw that Rafa Leao was getting in, into the game but you know having to work really hard on the left side really out on the edge which is usually not his game with Milan but actually work hard he did he also got another yellow card for another dive that's Leao for you, but he also was instrumental in the first goal being created. He makes the run, the ball comes then to Neto, who plays it across the box. It is being deflected onto Bernardo Silva, and it's 1-0 for Portugal. And that kind of set the game up in a certain way, and this was a deserved lead at that point. However, the game completely got killed by the most comically of own goals, because it was a miscommunication. In the attack, Joao Cancelo has the ball, he plays it forward, but completely misses Cristiano Ronaldo. You can see how he makes a hissy fit, throwing his hands up in the air. Then the cameraman thought, this is the story, we need to focus on that, because everything else is fine. And the next time you see the full view of the pitch, instead of the close-up shot of Ronaldo being completely annoyed, the ball is already rolling towards goal, and there is a mad dash is to save it from that. What had happened is that Akadin, once the ball was misplaced by Cancelo, tries to play it, looks up first, sees the goal is in his net. But the goal is completely unmotivated and he's the reserve goalkeeper. Runs out without telling anyone and Akadin has never looked back again and plays the ball where he thought the goal is. And it's an absolutely comically own goal that completely killed Turkey. Yes, Turkey then maybe tried in the anger to push a little bit, but it was never happening. In fact, the backline was then so unsorted that they even allowed Cristiano Ronaldo and Bruno Fernandes to run freely onto the goalie. And to everyone's surprise, Cristiano Ronaldo did not take a shot by himself, but he squared it over to Bruno Fernandes. He is now the highest assist giver in Euro history, so another record broken, but that's basically down to him playing Euro after Euro after Euro after Euro. But Crucially enough, he is not the oldest goal scorer still. It's still Ivica Savastis from Lusk back in the day. So yeah, I'm holding on to that record very, very dearly. We also have to talk about the pitch invaders. I mean, I'm fine with the young kid and, you know, him being then escorted off and, you know, Ronaldo playing nice. But then there's five adults coming on. You're just nuts, but, you know. I don't know, people are going crazy about stuff. But with that... Portugal win the group. They are now on the same side of the bracket as Spain. Is that good? We'll see. We'll talk about that when we look at the bracket, the projections. And the last game we have to talk about is, of course, Belgium against Romania. A game that was very much anticipated because we knew that if Belgium wins it, then all teams are level on three points, which, of course, is great drama, makes it look all fine. And that's exactly what we got. But ahead of the game, we knew that Belgium, actually, if you look at it, they didn't play that badly against Slovakia. 
It's just that they let themselves down by, you know, sloppy mistakes and maybe the lineup, you know, with Mangala and Doku and so on, it did not quite work out. But overall, they created chances, they should have scored goals. Unfortunately, you have one of the most imposing, but also one of the clumsiest strikers up front in Lukaku and he again was kind of in there. This time Belgium scored early against the Romania side that had surprised everyone. The Romania side is actually has quite some good players in there. Maybe not high profile, but when you look at how they play, they, there's quite some skill in this Romania squad. So it doesn't come from nowhere that they're actually quite good. But this time Belgium were really bad and very, very early on. It's an attack where the ball then is tapped by Lukaku who drops it off to Tillemans, takes a shot. One minute, 15 seconds. It's 1-0 for Belgium. And at that point, and I thought, ooh, this is going to be a really rough night for Romania. Because for the next few minutes, Belgium had them on the ropes. It was only late on that Romania could actually liberate themselves a little bit. However, once they liberated themselves, they kept the game quite open. And it was a very nice up and down affair. But Belgium were always more threatening. And they thought they had finally gotten their second goal in the 63rd minute when Lukaku pulled in, celebrating, da, da, da. But by now we have to know that whenever Lukaku scores... There is something in the build-up. And this time it's just his kneecap was offside. And yes, I also feel that this was not a problem that we needed to solve with offside. We needed to solve much more egregious offensive. Now we are nitpicking. On the other side, it kind of fits with Lukaku. As I said, imposing. He does a lot of work for his team. He's a great goal scorer as well. But he's also clumsy because he's so big. And he makes... Big man mistakes, I don't even want to call it mistakes, but you know, big man actions that are just clumsy and that's why it doesn't work out for him. Let's put it just the way it is. However, Belgium do get their second goal in a phase where they really need to kill off the game. The assist came from Castells, the goalkeeper, from a really deep kick and the Romanian defense try, try to estimate by cool stop De Bruyne who in the 8th minute makes it 2-0. That's the game. It's, yes. Romanian potentially would have deserved to get a goal, but I think the win for Belgium, that was easy. And also with the two goal scoreline, this means that the Belgium move all the way up to second place, putting themselves in a much better position than they had been before. And so with match day two completed, we have just one last round of games that we have to look at. So let's have a look at the projections, you know, groups A through D. We have talked at length about it in previous videos. So just keep it up. Let's look at the two groups that we had yesterday. Belgium back on top as favorites and Ukraine despite the win out because they have to play Belgium. That's not a good position to be in. But, you know, if everything goes square, actually Romania will win the group ahead of Belgium. That could also have a huge impact on how the final bracket pans out. Portugal have won it. Turkey still holds on, although I feel that the Czechs could beat Turkey. Especially if Turkey is open like that, but then a draw will be enough for Turkey. That a draw would also mean that the Czechs are most likely going out. That's why they are on the outside looking in, which would mean that Scotland actually have a relatively good shot. But let's see about that, what they will do tonight, more on that in a little bit. At the top two third place teams are Slovakia and Austria, and then Slovenia is also in there, which means that the bracket at the moment, we have Spain, Germany and Portugal all in the upper quadrant. So if Germany win their group, this is quite loaded up there. And now imagine that the Dutch win group D. And suddenly France is also in there. So we have now Portugal against the Netherlands. We have Portugal against France. And then add to it, the Belgium will only be second in the group. And this becomes super, super loaded. So we have again a high possibility of this being uneven. Also add to it, if England do not win the group, they may play Germany. <laughs> Interesting stuff, yeah? So this could get really, really weird. Because we will have one side of the draw, like in 2016, where all the big teams are in there, and then a much lighter bottom side of the draw. However, if it pans out, as we would expect, Belgium and France would meet in the quarters, and then England would play Austria. <laughs> Don't like that one. Oh, maybe I should like that one. The way England have been playing, I think Austria can do something. And Switzerland against Italy. And it would not surprise if Austria played in Switzerland in the quarterfinal. But it also means that the lower quadrant is a relatively easy schedule. Let's face it, that still Spain against France at the moment. And I think this feels a little bit right. However, France have to score goals on their own as well. For today, 
It's only two games and they're all at the late kickoff. And I don't quite understand that we have Sunday and Monday now only nine o'clock kickoffs and then only Tuesday and Wednesday we get two kickoffs again. I think the weekend would be predestined to have groups B and A wrapped up. Whatever it is, Switzerland against Germany for the win in the group. Scotland need to beat Hungary or the other way around as well to have a chance of surviving. Scotland definitely, if they get the win, it looks good for them. Uh, if Hungary, you know, they have two losses, might be iffy. I think that is probably the more interesting game, although probably more focus, at least around here, will be given to the Switzerland-Germany game. In any case, please let me know what you thought about the game today. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video, subscribe to my channel for some more videos like this, and I will talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video and if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you may enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.